All right, good morning, everybody. We're going to uh, get started here with Ms. Tina Mitchell, and she's going to be presenting uh, some information on special needs transportation, the do's and don'ts, and how to keep out of trouble. Um, Ms. Mitchell is currently the special needs coordinator for South Car Greenville, South Carolina. She is a certified um, Director of Pupil Transportation. She is the current president-elect for the National Association of Pupil Transportation also. So she has a pretty wide-ranging background in pupil transportation, as go her school bus purse and her school bus earrings. <laughs> she does some free school bus transportation, which is awesome. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Christina. today? Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. Well, thank you first for inviting me to your conference. I certainly appreciate that. I, I've enjoyed my trip to Louisiana. And I think I could sit and listen to you guys talk all day long and never get bored. I just I love the accent here. So, um, again, thanks for inviting me. Let's talk about a, uh, keeping your district out of trouble. Is that what pretty much we want to do today? thinking about what a school bus is. I was sitting at a table earlier with a few of you guys and it was like when somebody sees a yellow school bus, what do they hear? Cha-ching, cha-ching, you know what that means? They oh, yeah. think all districts have have money. So, you know, with uh, the least little thing, we're going to go to court, right? And uh, they think everything ends up being money. So let's talk about that just a little bit. All right. First, we need to think about the legal basis. What, what, are the, what, are, what do we, as a district, have to do, right? Because that tells us where we can go with our decisions. We need to know what legally we need to, to think about. When you're talking about special needs, there's a few things you need to keep in mind. The 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment says that we have to have equal rights, correct? If you look at IDEA, that requires the IEP team to make decisions. Why is that a good thing? Why is it a good thing that we have an IEP team making decisions? Sets guidelines and it keeps any individual from having to make a decision, correct? If it's a team of people together, a team of people for this one child to make decisions so that you can get input from many different areas of that child's education. So how many of you guys actually attend IEP meetings? Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit later. <laughs> there should be more than that because who's the expert here? You are. If you're in transportation and you are the expert because who's in this IEP meeting making these decisions? Teachers, could be nurses, could be parents, and that's where I was going with this, was parents, because parents think they own the IEP team, right? They do not. They're one voice. Even these doctor's notes that you get, what are they? Are they the say all do all? They're one voice in that IEP. So if you're not in that IEP meeting, the expert's missing from the table. So how do you get in an IEP meeting? Because they're sure not going to invite you, right? Absolutely. And that, that is actually what you need to do. You need to make friends with who? Special ed directors. Hey, yes. You make friends with the special ed director and you let them know that you have knowledge because what they're going to do is they're going to say, what are you bringing to the table? Why should I invite you to this table? What are you bringing? When you come to places like this, you come to your conference and you get this knowledge, you've got to take it back and tell somebody. If you keep it to yourself, there's no sense in you even being here because you're not getting to do what you actually come to learn. 
So you know, pick up that phone to that um, that whoever is, is over your special needs department and say, hey, you know, this is what's happened. You know, I have this kind of knowledge. Let me come to that table. Invite yourself to that table. Because if you don't, they're going to write checks that you can't cash on that bus. We'll talk about the IEP a little bit more later, but that's your end. That's going to be your end to be in that expert at the table. All right, Amy, um, uh, the IEP team also gives you specific instructions. Why is that important? Keep a child safe. Because you may get a child on your bus you don't know anything about, right? What if that child comes to your bus with a VIP? Does anybody know what that is? Behavior intervention plan. Behavior intervention plan. Does your bus driver know that they have to specifically follow that plan? If they don't, what can happen? <laughs> you end up in court. You're going to get in trouble because you didn't follow that plan. So, so think about that. And a little bit later, we're going to kind of open it up and talk about some, some uh, IEPs. I, um, ADA, of course, that sets forth rules defining what a disability is. Do you train your people on what the disabilities are? Do you specifically go into strategies with each kind of disability that, that is presented on the bus? If we go and talk to your drivers and say, if you have a child with autism, what's some of the strategies you use? Consistency? Mm -hmm. What else? How about, would you, would you set a child that has autism by an emergency exit or near one? Does your driver know that? Think about it. If your driver don't know that and something happens and you have a train, everybody has a liability down to here, right? Anything that happens on your school bus, your district is liable. But in some of these instances we're going to talk about today, that's when your liability goes from here to here. We want to stop it. We don't want it to get it here. You're always going to have it here. We never want it here. 504. Do you may know what a 504 is? When do you? Correct. Why do we need a 504? Why do we need to put that in place? Because you may have a child that has a broken leg. It needs a lift bus because they can't, they can't put any pressure on this leg. Why do you specifically need it written in a 504? Correct. It defines what the services should be and should not be. It also gives direction. It also is a team effort. And what's that team effort that do? It takes it off of the individual to make a split-second decision. It also documents your plan. Documents your plan. And if they end up moving from one location to the other, that plan now can follow them. And faith. It made transportation a what? A related service. And why is that important? It puts you at the table. You are a related service, so therefore it gives you the opportunity to set at that table, to set at that IP table, set at that 504 table, because you are a related service. Just like any other related service that comes to that table. You may need occupational therapy, you may need physical therapy. Would you have someone come to the table for a child that needs physical therapy that's not a physical therapist? So why would you let others make transportation decisions when you are that professional? Right? So that gives us a seat 
seat at the table. It also gives us an opportunity to call an IEP meeting. How many of you have called an IEP meeting? Got one? Why would you call an IEP meeting? What, what do you think some of the circumstances would be to call an IEP meeting? Documented things before we move to that. 
For instance, you're on a regular bus and this student keeps getting out of the state. Right? What do you do? What would be your next step? Document. You know, what I do is when, 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 I, have a, when I have a doctor that says this student's getting out of the seat, the first thing I do is print a calendar off and hand it to them. Why do I do that? How often it happens, what's happening when it's happening, um, how many times you have to stop that bus, how late it's causing that bus drop because you're stopping the bus. All of this needs to go into an IEP meeting. Once it gets into that IEP meeting, when we show this documentation, then we come up with a plan. Now, if that plan is the safety desk, is that the end of the road? What should you then do? Your 
uh, buses is on the road doing routes, right? So they get a, um, a charter bus, right? The regular ed kid gets a charter bus. And there is a wheelchair that has to go that the charter bus does not support. What does your district have to do? You have to supply a bus for the kid, even if you have to pull a driver off route to do it. You cannot deny them that transportation. What happens if your district says, well, if we're going to have to get another bus, this is going to cost more. So, you know, the kids, instead of paying X amount of dollars for a regular ed, now they're going to have to pay X more amount of dollars because there's a child on here that has special needs and we need to get this equipment. In the district pocket, not the kids' pockets, okay? You, you know, you can't charge a student with disabilities more for field trips than other students. So keep that in mind. Um, what happens if you are transporting, we had one, we had a, a, and I don't know exactly how you guys do your sporting events, but you know, if a team has to leave at 3 o'clock in the day to get to uh, uh, an event or a, a game that night, who drives the bus? Is it drivers? Do you have drivers to do that? Or do you have like coaches that's that licensed? Both. Both. Coaches? Both. Are both? Okay. We, we had coaches mainly that does that, you know, if it's during the, the game that is licensed. But we had one student that was a wheelchair, he, he was in a wheelchair, and he was on the football team. Okay? He was like an assistant coach on the football team. So now we had to figure out how to get this child in a wheelchair to all the games because the little bus that the school had there didn't transport a chair. Now what? What do you think we had to do? Make accommodations. We, we, we ended up having to buy a, a, a smaller bus that had a chair to put at that school and then we had to train that coach how to transport chairs. And we had to document that we trained that coach how to, do, how to transport chairs. Why? That's it. Keep our liability here, right? Not here. So think about that. If you, if you need to do that, that's, that's exactly what you're going to have to do. All right, how about vocational? <clears throat> you guys transport your students with disabilities to different vocationals to where they, they learn life skills, like shopping or you know, things like that. Okay, that is, we have to do that because what are we setting these kids up for? Like, and if we fail stuff up, is that what? We really failed in our job. And, and when, you, when you're thinking about vacations and set these kids up for life, you may have a student that is elementary school that needs all of these services and you're providing it on a most restrictive environment, a special ed class, going curve to curve every day, right? As this kid gets older, what should you do? Pull some of these services back and allow that student to grow. Because by the time this student is in high school, do you still want them on that special needs bus? Not if you can avoid it, because then you're setting them up for failure if they need to take a public bus, right? Because if they need to take a public bus, they need to be able to go to a bus stop. They need to be able to transition onto a bus. Okay? So think about your goal and that student's goal to have them more independent and not just year after year let that IP team continuously place this child in the most restrictive environment. Okay? We want to back off of that. All right, what about transitional? 
Do you got to be transitional? Do you have students that send, say, uh, middle school and they're transitioning to a high school next year? Do you provide that kind of transitional services to take them up, maybe let them stay an hour at the high school, take them back home? Sometimes that works really well as far as especially students that have behavior issues to start that transitioning toward the end of the school year. And if you're in that IEP meeting, guess what? You have a voice. Remember that. You have a voice in that IEP meeting to help some of this transition because we know especially students with autism, what happens when things change? Things really change, right? <laughs> Disruptive behavior because they're not expecting the change. Um, if, if, if you think about if your bus breaks down and you have a child with autism on there, what usually happens? You usually see some behavior issues. Why? You're changing their routine without warning. You know. The first thing you should train your drivers to do if they have a child with autism, if anything changes, they need to be talking to the student, giving them information. If there's a detour and you go off route, that can cause major issues if you're not talking. If you're a bus driver or your attendant is not talking to that student with autism. Another transition is child with
That is the number one OCR component. <coughs> so how do you correct that? Make sure the operators know the appropriate time to pick up the students. Excuse me? Make sure the operator knows the appropriate time to pick up the students. And, uh, that, absolutely. Make sure your bus driver knows that they can't leave that school until the designated time. And then make sure that school doesn't put those kids on the bus 10 minutes early for your bus driver to babysit, right? So how do you go about making sure this happens? Schedule and training the bus drivers. You know, when we made this transition in our district, when I, you know, when I got to our district many, many years ago, it was like, we get, to, we get these special needs buses there as early as we can, and we get these kids on there and we get them out the door. And we're like, wait a minute, what about your instructional time? Because that is listed in there what? IEP. IEP. It's listed in there. So if you add it up, guess what? They're missing instructional time. So you need to train your bus drivers. You need to tell them, if they bring these kids out early, I need to know about it. And then you need to address it with the school. Okay? You need to call that school and say, you know, the IEP says their instructional time is X, Y, Z. If you bring them out 10 minutes early every day, that's 50 minutes a week. They are missing in instructional time. That is the court case. That will put you in court if they see if the parents see fit. What about being late? You know, if you're short bus drivers, how many of your districts think, well, it's better for this uh, special needs bus that has 10 kids on it to be an hour late versus 60 kids? in an hour late, right? <laughs> See how that works for you in court, right? <laughs> you, you can't do that. You know, just because there's only two kids on that bus and it sounds better, that's going to get you in trouble. So you got to be sure that you, you give the students their allotted time. What happens generally if you get a lot of time up, and this child's missed a lot of instructional time. What do you think happens there? Then you make that schedule. Now you gotta find a driver to get some uh, makeup time um, uh, when it's not your normal route time. So it causes more stress. All right. Um, All right, how close are you to the edge? What do you think? You feeling good? You feeling good about all the things you do to keep yourself out of trouble? All right, let's talk about a case. Let's talk about a few cases. A six-year-old Cynthia was strangled by her harness, which uh, resulted in her death. Mm. Think about this. She has uh, musculoskeletal problems. She can't hold her head up. So the IEP team decided, okay, we're going to have this special seat that we're going to transport her. <coughs> right? <coughs> special seat? It's on order. What does that mean if it's on order? Good luck. It's not in stock. Right. That means it's going to take some time to get this seat to them, right? So what do we do in the meantime? What would your district do in the meantime? Okay. I, I, I'm thinking this. I'm thinking this. Think, think of the way he's thinking over here. You're in that IP meeting, and you have a nurse, you have a doctor, you have a physical therapist, and they're going to decide how to transport the student, right? <laughs> on the bus, though. You got to think about that. On the bus. So, so who is the expert on that bus? 
those operators. You are. And you've got to know whether or not it works on that bus. Simple. Okay. okay. So, on the bus. Okay. That's correct. So let's think about this. If the IDP team says the best way to transport this child is in this particular parcel, should you transport that kid any other way? No. There you go. You're taking a risk if you do anything different than what the IEP team said is best for that student. <clears throat> now in this situation, they're like, hmm, it's gonna take a while to get this equipment, right? Let's just put her in a safety vest for now. Now think about that. If a safety vest worked, you wouldn't be ordering that seat, right? That would be the least restrictive environment. <coughs> Guess what? That's what this school district did. Put her in a safety vest. Not only that, the safety vest was put on backwards and zipped it through. Not only that, there was not an aid or an attendant on that bus. What happened? Put him in a ride. She became strangled. She died. Think about that. Think about your district trying to say, we really need this kid on this bus. You know? We gotta get him on the bus. You know. What else could this school district have done? <laughs> uh, yep, pay your parents to bring him. What else? Put an aid on the bus to watch her. That would have been a mitigating incident. Although they should not have put that safety vest on her in the first place because they all knew it wasn't set. They knew it. That's why they, they, they did this thing. You know, they could have provided services at home for this kid in immediate until we got the equipment in place. So, so think about, you know, when this district says, well, we're going to do this because we don't want to provide these kinds of services. We need her on that bus, so let's put let's her on that bus. What is your trunk card? Safety. Safety is always your trunk card. If you're in that IEP meeting and you say, that's not safe, and you start telling them why it's not safe, and you start telling them the cost of what can happen if this child is not transported safely, you know, when you're at that table and you're telling them these things, it's hard for them to say we're going to do it because then they're going against what's safe. But if there's not a voice at that table, they're liable to write anything on that transportation board. So think about that. Think about getting yourself at that table. Exactly. And that he is absolutely correct. And again, that's how you get to the table, is with your knowledge. If you don't have anything to say, you're not going to be invited to that table. You've got to have the knowledge and you've got to have the education. And, you know, with all your vendors around here, you've got to know what's out there and available for you that works on the school bus. How many of you have uh, any type of an infant program on your bus? Is anybody transporting infants? Infants, like, like maybe a, a, a teen mom program where the, where the infants go to school, some districts have that. Well, um, I think also, how many of you have standard car seats for like your three-year-olds or your four-year-olds? Do you have standard car seats? Have you did research on those? Is that the best thing for a school bus? And that's, that's where I'm going with this. Do your research because even though that, that standard
standard car seat is gray in an automobile. An automobile is designed much different than a school bus. You know, sometimes the um, distance between your seats causes issues with standards. Also, you need at least eight inches of that uh, car seat to be on, on the school bus seat. Sometimes in a school bus, that's, that's not good. You know, it doesn't work that way. So if you put it in there and it's not meeting all the standards, where does your liability go? It, 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 it changes again, right? So think about, you know, our, our, our seats that are designed for school buses. You know, move more toward that and kind of bring your district along with you when you're when you're researching these products that's available to you. Yes. Can we put a plug in for the NCSD specification for the procedures section of transporting in our Absolutely. You know, NISA has all I mean they have a whole school bus curriculum. Uh, the national, uh, yes, na National Congress. Yes. You know, absolutely. Any kind of information that you can get or research on. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, think, think about that. And have one of those in your district. <coughs> ha have one in your district. You know, also, uh, my good friend, Linda Blue, she has uh, the fifth edition of the um, Transporting Students with Disabilities uh, Manual Act. Get a hold of that because that tells you, that kind of gives you a, uh, each individual uh, law and how it applies to the district, how, it, how, how, what you can do. So get a hold of that as well. So thanks for and, putting that in. And Unit 6 of the Louisiana School Bus Driver Forces on track. Okay. So, so get some of that and educate yourself so that you can go into these IEPs and you can go to your district and say, you know, we need this, you know, we need this product. So, look at this lawsuit that happened with, with, with our little case here with uh, Cynthia. Look how much it costs this district. Can your district afford to pay that? How many bus drivers? Salaries can we pay on that? How many buses can we buy for this one case? One case that if you have had a transportation specialist, which is all of you guys, armed with the knowledge, knowing what's out there, what products is out there for you to use, knowing the options to use until this, the products can come in. Look what you could have saved your school district. All right, we had a um, student uh, foot got broken while loading him from the, well, putting him from the bus onto the lift. Broke his foot. The driver did not notice the foot got caught between the lift door and the wheelchair. Turn the foot all the way around backwards. Oh, good. Did, the bus driver did not even realize he had broke the foot. How do you think we figured that out? When Mama called us? Mama called us and said, I think this foot's broken. Did that happen on the bus? <coughs> Although we were thinking, there's no way that happened on the bus, right? <coughs> we pulled the video. Guess what? It happened on the bus. It happened on the bus. So, how can we prevent this? Training, emphasizing awareness for student lens. Put your eyes on the student. If the driver would have been watching the student, then he would have seen where his foot was. Where should his foot be? Either on the footrest, if there is one, but it should be in front of the student, not off of the side of the wheelchair when you are moving that wheelchair. 
circumstances. How many of you train this? Don't raise your hands, but just think about it. How many of you train, look at the chair, look at the student, keep your eyes on the student, especially if they're nonverbal? This student was nonverbal and had a high pain tolerance. Okay? He didn't even cry. But you did see some facial expression if you would have been paying attention to that student. Okay? So you're going to teach, you know, teach your bus drivers that these kids don't always cry out in pain. I mean, this foot turned completely backwards and he never cried out. All right, so if this goes to court, what do you want? What, what do you want in your pocket to keep your liability to here? Do you document your driver training? Because if it's not written down, it didn't happen. I don't care how much you say it did. If it's not documented, there's no sense in even taking it to court. Because that's going to be your set, right? So think about documentation on wheelchair training. Not only do you need to make sure you train it, you need to what? Make sure they got it. If you don't test them to see if they retain the knowledge, how do you know they got it? Think about when you train, you test. Um, documenting sensitivity training. How many of you do sensitivity training? Absolutely, that is wonderful. You have to do sensitivity training. You need them to look at your person, at the student. Be sensitive to their needs. Yes? Mm. So, we can 
can identify through transportation form, right, the possible aggression of the attacker. So if you would have had that transportation form that says, kid so-and-so bites anybody he's near, right? What's that going to tell your bus driver? Move the job. You should be really synthesizing them, right? Well, what is it going to tell your transportation department? You probably need somebody on this bus watching this job, right? Um, what if you, if the ones who have video in their buses, do you randomly watch your videos? Mm -hmm. Do you document that you randomly watch your videos? Why should you document if you randomly watch your videos? It, it actually helps in your training. It also documents if you go to court that you are actively trying to prevent issues, okay? Which helps your liability because you're not just saying, well, whatever happens on this bus happens, right? We are actively watching these videos.
Now, he's a wheelchair student. Uh, we have other wheelchair, another wheelchair student on the bus, so he's in proximity to the other wheelchair student that uh, is participating as the only person that's really in danger other than the age. So he's got pretty good at it. He has pretty good at it. Uh, so, um, the Sped Park did come to me about putting up the shower curtain, shower curtain around the student, but uh, I was in consultation with a couple of people uh, that would have struck the driver's view and things like that to put the shower curtain. So, we're still working on it. My other suggestion was to pay the uh, adult medical care service to take him to and from school until I get a driver. I was sure, I mean, my first solution would be get a driver for the Bus by itself, but that's not viable right now. So, uh, what would you suggest to that? Well, I guess I'm trying to alter his behavior, would be, would be my first guess. And it's important to, to you know, if he is if, if he is able to modify his behavior, but if he, he's good enough to take things off, he could probably, we could probably modify his behavior. So I would, I would probably get with his teacher and his parent and say, you know, what does this kid like? You know, what does he like? There's got to be something, and, and I'll, I'll give you a for instance. We had a kid that wouldn't get off the school bus. Okay, she just wouldn't get off the school bus. We had to sit there 45 minutes because we couldn't physically remove it. We called mom to the bus, we called daddy to the bus, we called grandma to the bus. We couldn't get her off the bus. And so I ended up calling an IEP meeting. I'm like, this kid's got to like something, you know. And mom was like, the only thing she likes is the radio, and I can't have those on the bus. I'm like, I don't want her on the bus. I want her off the bus. We stood out there with two burritos every morning, and she ran off that bus, OK? About six weeks later, we had to change the Cheetos because she got tired of burritos. But, but what I'm saying is, is find something to try to modify the behavior. Now, it, you know, there, there is some new products up out there um, that you can look at during COVID. You know, we had, we had some um, uh, see-through screens that were flapping that you could hook to the top of the bus and bottom of the bus to protect the driver, okay? So you might want to think about something like that to put between the chairs that is removable in case, you, you know, if you if, if, when you remove it, you get hooked from the top and bottom. You may want to try that temporarily while you're trying to modify the behavior. But I think modifying that kind of behavior works sometimes if you know what the child really likes. And then work toward, um, you know, if you, if you don't fit between this stop and this stop, you get it. You know, this stop and then kind of making it longer and longer until it's the whole bus ride. But that would be a suggestion. Anybody else have a suggestion? Because that's how we learn. I don't know all the answers, you know, but I like to facilitate the answers. Get everybody involved because, you know, whatever works for you sometimes works for others. Anybody else? Anybody got any more questions about this one? Would you mind addressing what happens when the parent tries to veto everything the IED committee is recommending? Okay. Again. When that parent is on the IEP team, and that parent doesn't want anything that you are suggesting, does that parent rule legally? No, no. How many voices does that parent have? One. One. So what happens if you say, and I'm just, I'm just going to give it for instance, if you have documented this child being out of the city, right? Documented it, you have a plan to move forward, but the IEP team recommends a safety vest for this student, and the parent says, You can put my kid in that. Where does that leave you? Where does that leave the district? What should you say to that IEP team? That's not safe for the child to not be in the best. So therefore, in order for us to provide transportation safely, this is how it needs to happen. And the parent says, you ain't put my kid in the best. You may transfer your own student to the school if you 
would like to do so, but we are willing to provide safe transportation for your student. We are willing to do that. Since IEP is going to be here, whether you think on that bus or not is your choice, parent. But you still provide it, you still put it on there, you still make it available. I think you had a question. Could you speak a little bit about uh, administering uh, medication on the bus? Uh, absolutely. He wanted, he wanted some, uh, to talk about administering uh, medication on the bus. How many of you get a dog scout on the bus? You have it been challenging for it, yes. Um, Emergency medications can be administered on the bus. Um, I'm not sure, now I'm talking, um, I, I don't know what your, your, your district or your state's rules are, but if you're challenged in court, I know Georgia was challenged in court with that because they, they said that they were, they were not going to provide that out on the bus. Okay? And they were challenging court. Who do you think won? No, I don't. Yep, Georgia didn't win that one. <laughs> um, what they ended up saying is if the doctor said that this child had to be administered diastat within five minutes, if he was in a seizure more than five minutes. So what, what do you think, think the court said? If you can get this kid home in five minutes, you don't have to do it. But if you can't, guess what? You have to do it, George, to figure it out. Now, your state may have a different rule, and I'd have to, I'd have to talk to your, your, your nurses to find out, but um, it can, you can have a nurse on the bus to administer this if, it's, if that's what it is in your state. In our state, we can have a nurse train a lay person, so our, our bus drivers and our attendants actually uh, administer DOSCAT on the bus. Um, and, and, you know, anything else, like if, if, like if we have um, an EpiPen, how many of you have EpiPens on the bus? Do you train your drivers to administer it? Yes. Do you document it? Okay. Um, you, it's CPR, you know, you, you may provide that on the bus. If you don't provide that, you can probably provide some training with, without necessarily CPR. Why do you think some school districts don't provide CPR training? What would you think would be a reason not to provide it? Yes, it's the responsibility because if you, if you train your drivers and they, they are actually certified, then anything they do goes against that certification. If they're not certified and they try to help someone and something goes bad, what, what is it under them? Good Samaritan. So you kind of use, sometimes you have to weigh, you know, what kind of responsibility do you do want? We had a legislator who filed a bill last year requiring certified CPR, certification for CPR for all bus drivers to be contested. So that for that reason, for that reason. Plus, you would have to have it on the day for all your, your people. You would. That's and and that, that's a good reason. And, and, and you know, sometimes stating that with as soon as somebody hears, well, CPR, that's a great idea. Yeah. But then it can personally make your best part of personal for that. So, and your surplus. So, think about that. But as far as an um, EpiPen, an inhaler, a uh, DICAT, you know, you, you really should provide that kind of training for your drivers in case they do need to administer. And again, if you've never been challenged, and you say we don't do guys that, good for you. But if you have a challenge, we can pick it. Yeah. <laughs> because it will come. So we, we have quite a few students that require it. And there's a, there's a new one out that's a, a little bit less. Um, uh, <laughs> well, it, it, you kind of measure. You know, guys that is given directly, and that sometimes is, you know, doctors and, and 
they just don't want to do that, especially on the bus. But, but they have to be an Aisley now that's a form of God's that as well. And it's easier to give, but it has more stock effects. They're easier to quit breathing. So you kind of got but yeah, that's not up to you. It's up to the doctors. And I know all the doctors who prescribe in the nasal just because it's a little less invasive to the body. But how should you train your drivers when you do give medication? Have a certified nurse do it and document the training. If you have a bus driver and have a student, if you only do that one bus driver, what, do you have? what happens when you have a sub? So if you do that on a bus, what should you really do? All your drivers need that training so you don't have to think, okay, does this driver have that kind of training? Or does this driver, because if you make a wrong call, and something goes really bad, what's going to happen? Yeah, your liability goes up. All right, I've went over my time a little bit, but I really enjoyed the questions and the talking. And I'll see you this afternoon. If you have any questions, I'll be around.